Hello, my name is Parker Teed at the Washington State Board of Education. I'm the basic education manager, and one of my duties at the board is basic education compliance and the reporting of the useful data for the 2020-2021 school year. I've been doing this for uh, nearly eight years now. Basic education compliance is a core duty of the State Board of Education to ensure the implementation of the program of basic education, to achieve the goals of basic education as articulated in statute. The board has established its process for entering a mandatory compliance agreement process in WAC 180-16-195 and may recommend withholding of funds Though in practice, districts have been responsive to compliance concerns by voluntarily resolving issues. The basic education compliance process relies on status changes and requests for revision from school districts when there are compliance concerns, and it occurs through the iGrant system that is part of the OSPI administered educational data system. Some of the revisions that SBE staff send out are due to input errors and others result in immediate policy change at the district level, um, sometimes for a cohort already in the system. Identified compliance concerns have been resolved by requesting the district's assurance that they will resolve the concern, but there is a more structured mandatory compliance agreement process the SBE could engage in if a district was unwilling uh, or unable to resolve the problem, or if the board otherwise deemed it appropriate. As the data is analyzed after approval by the state board, more districts will be contacted if any compliance issues are identified. In addition to districts assuring and demonstrating compliance, there are research questions focused on instructional hours, the high school and beyond plan, district schedule, graduation requirements, including graduation pathway options, mastery-based crediting, and additional or optional graduation requirements. You'll see data on those shortly. Most of this presentation is focused on key takeaways from the data that are useful for analytical purposes. But I wanna remind viewers that the basic education compliance process results in policy changes at the district level to bring them into alignment with minimum state graduation requirements and other minimum state basic education requirements. Throughout the years, this process has been instrumental to monitoring district implementation of the increase of instructional hours in the 2015-2016 school year, the increase of math credit graduation requirements from two to three credits, social studies from 2.5 to three credits, and English to four credits ahead of 24 credit implementation. It is also been involved in the implementation of career and college ready graduation requirements for the class of 2019, 2020, and 2021, depending on the use of the temporary delay waiver for up to two years for districts. The different aspects of the subject area credit graduation requirements, and also the policies such as graduation pathways or competency or now referred to mastery-based crediting um, that support the career and college ready graduation requirements. The provision of the high school and beyond plan at appropriate grade levels with an electronic platform as required uh, during this school year. Financial education as a goal of basic education, we examined that and how um, computer education, technological education, uh, as goals of the program of basic education are being required by districts. And also unique to this school year, policy responses to COVID-19, including reopening plans for the 2021 school year and uh, flexibility around the instructional requirements as made an emergency and permanent rule. This slide shows an overview of the basic education compliance reporting requirements. Uh, it's form package 600 and I grants for those district administrators out there. And the first set of requirements 
is time. And that provides an overview of the challenges of the pandemic to the education system and the State Board of Education's recent rulemaking on instructional hours to um, provide for districts to respond to public health measures that uh, close schools. The questions are focused on time requirements such as instructional hours and school days, schedule type, and provision of the high school and beyond plan. Page two is focused on reopening planning due to COVID-19 and provides district assurance that they have completed reopening plans. This page was primarily used to reinforce the necessity of submitting reopening plans. It also included, included policy feedback from uh, school districts that we utilized in uh, you know, understanding uh, ways to alleviate uh, challenges and barriers faced by school districts uh, during COVID-19 response. Page three is focused on graduation requirements and includes subject area credit requirements and provision of additional or optional graduation requirements. Page four is simply a certificate of compliance that is signed by the superintendent and chair of the school board. This is assurance that they are meeting all minimum requirements. Throughout the basic education compliance form, uh, we ask both uh, detailed questions to get at particular uh, uh, policy you know, nuances or, or minimum requirements that we're, we're, we're interested in. Um, well, not just interested in, but also ensuring the implementation of. Uh, but this page uh, and, and the prior ones all also include uh, broad questions as to the minimum requirements of the program of basic education, uh, so that um, even if we aren't dealing with a particular detail, we are referencing the general obligation of the school district future revisions to the form to focus in on specific policies, uh, our implementation of since time immemorial. Staff are working with the, in collaboration with John Claymore um, and his fellow uh, Office of Native Ed Education staff, and also the State Tribal Education Compact School Group that I sit on to develop these questions. Another revision that's being considered are grade band uh, questions. Uh, staff plan to develop a, a question about grade levels uh, that are served at a school district and also initiation of high school and beyond plans um, at districts that do not offer high school. What we're going for there is to ensure implementation of the high school beyond plan if appropriate in eighth grade in districts that uh, don't offer high school. The uh, current form responses are of limited use of getting to that, uh, that policy objective of having uh, high school and beyond plans in non-high school districts, uh, if, if in fact required by law. Uh, we're also going to examine the fitness and health split. Um, districts have implemented health and fitness requirements with at least two credits not when combined. So they're in compliance with at least two credits of fitness and health. Um, but this is the first year that we disaggregated uh, fitness at 1.5 credits from half a credit of health. And districts um, don't all uh, deal with that nuance of that 1.5 and 0.5 uh, credit split. So we're going to consider uh, how to address that during the next basic education compliance process hopefully without causing any unintended consequences for schools with robust uh, fitness and, and health requirements that may label them as just two with the health embedded. Um, then we also seek to broaden basic education questions to get at that uh, instructional requirements and program accessibility um, duty uh, as, as, as mentioned in basic ed law. And uh, one of our goals there is to focus on opportunity and um, you know quality of, of the uh, the offerings as well as you know the the minimum uh, compliance requirements. Uh, 
uh, we're seeking uh, to add questions uh, that focus on time before high school. Uh, what, one example is there are a specified number of minutes required for recess at grade levels uh, below high school. Um, and that's the sort of law that we could analyze and ensure that districts are doing that within basic education compliance. Also other uh, uh, statutory obligations of school districts that come from the legislature um, or from rulemaking by state agencies, uh, we can ensure implementation of and, and monitor progress toward. So when do school districts begin the high school and beyond plan? The answer is predominantly at eighth grade. 60%, so nearly two thirds of all districts in the state, um, and only 251 of those serve high school, um, begin the high school and beyond plan in eighth grade. The other districts responding to this question um, began in seventh grade at 22%, and only 7% seven, 7 begin in sixth grade. Although districts of all sizes were most likely to begin the high school and beyond plan in eighth grade, there were some interesting trends by size of district. Very large school districts were the most likely to begin in sixth grade. Medium and large districts were the most likely to begin in eighth grade. Let's look at the data behind the question. Of what grade levels do districts of differing sizes initiate the high school and beyond plan? The answer is that the districts that are most often going to initiate the high school and beyond plan as early as grade six are very large school districts of 10,000 or more students, accounting for 12% uh, of all districts uh, in that size category. Beyond that, uh, most districts uh, begin the high school and beyond plan in grade eight. And you see some variation across the size groupings, but really what stands out is that very large school districts um, are able to offer it at an earlier grade level than is uh, commonly offered within districts of different size groupings. Let's take a look into what platforms are used for the electronic high school and beyond plan. At 38% of the districts in the state, My Data Solutions by WSIPSI is the most widely used platform for the electronic high school and beyond plan and is evenly distributed across districts of different sizes. At 13%, Cello is used at large or very large school districts, seldom at small or medium districts, and not at all in very small districts. At 12%, is School Data Solutions, or WOICE, that is used by medium, large, or very large districts. At 8% is Google Forms, that is evenly used regardless of size of district, but is commonly used by rural and remote districts or suburban districts. Urban districts were unlikely to use Google Forms. At 6% is Navians, that is nearly exclusively used by large or very large school districts. Other electronic platforms uh, were very small in number and only used by large districts. And no districts reported the use of other known platforms such as Circled In, Cooter, uh, Major Clarity, or Use Science. And smaller districts were more likely to provide an electronic platform for the high school and beyond plan that is an email PDF for form uh, than their larger district counterparts that were more likely to have an interactive online platform and might have a particular vendor they're, they're using. In regards to the 2020 reopening plans, uh, basic education compliance uh, page, two uh, had focused on reopening plans. So they, we asked them uh, that they have submitted their plan two weeks before the school year. You know, they enter yes or no, only yes, 
you know, all districts uh, were compliant with this requirement uh, and that they do so two weeks before school begins. A question was asked about the anticipated start and end date of the school year. But the interesting information on the page is the question as to whether they were going to use the emergency rule on instructional hours. And the policy uh, was described in detail on the prior page of basic education and compliance, uh, outlining the emergency rule on instructional hours that uh, the State Board of Education has passed. And uh, in this chart, you can see that uh, as of uh, summer, so August, September, as districts were uh, filling out their draft versions of these forms before receiving requests for revisions back from, uh, from me, um, 83% to plan to, um, to begin uh, using that emergency rule on instructional hours. So of those results shown in this pie chart, 261 districts plan to use the emergency rule for the 2021 school year, uh, represented by the yes in the pie chart. 46 districts represented by Orange reported that they would only use the provisions of the emergency rule if local and or state or other public health requirements require closure. And then seven very small or small school districts indicated that they were not planning to use the emergency rule um, on instructional hours and, and plan to reopen in person. Uh, subsequent to the reopening plans that were collected uh, uh, by the Office of the Superintendent of Public Instruction and also submitted to the State Board of uh, Education, uh, OSPI has uh, updated a table and released it uh, publicly, likely weekly, uh, showing the number of districts offering uh, remote uh, online uh, instruction um, and by uh, what percentage of the student body uh, to show that districts are over time phasing in, although the state had mostly moved to uh, remote learning um, exclusively at the beginning of the school year. Uh, districts are beginning to phase in in-person instructional services as uh, local conditions permit, as their community uh, decides, and as public uh, state or local health requirements uh, compel them to. Let's take a look at which graduation requirement pathways or graduation pathways, are available by size of high school district. Of the school districts granting high school diplomas, 56% provide the advanced course taking pathway that includes AP, IB, and Cambridge, but only 6% of small school districts provide the pathway. Here's a chart, uh, the data behind that conclusion. It also shows some, uh, you know, the, the state assessments are widely available if a district uh, clicked yes on it. Um, it. Not all districts did, and we didn't treat that as a compliance question for this round of review um, uh, under the assumption they all do offer it. Um, there's been a lot of change from the prior year in uh, districts that allow for mastery-based crediting. Uh, this chart shows the change uh, year over year in mastery-based crediting by each subject area. What it shows overall is that the uh, variety, the array of different subject areas that were uh, allowed for in local district mastery-based crediting policies that are adopted by their school boards, um, that, that uh, diversified. Uh, one real noticeable drop here is in world language, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that fewer of those districts that had world language policies are after act uh, still allowing for it, but more so that they've uh, expanded into saying that all subjects um, may, on a case-by-case -case basis, um, 
be allowed in mastery based uh, crediting. Um, the, the element of the case by case basis uh, can't be inferred from just this data set, but I'm known from looking at the policies and from the responses that districts have provided that uh, when they tend to move to the all subjects area, they, they mention in a case by case basis so that if uh, there is an available uh, method to for a student to demonstrate the learning standards in, in an acceptable way, um, then then the policy is kept open to that. So uh, here you're seeing uh, fewer and fewer districts offering world language, which was kind of the prototype uh, state level collaboration between OSPI, the state board and WASDA um, to develop a, what at the time was being called competency-based crediting uh, uh, model uh, for world language that relied on the stamp and TOEFL tests. Well, it's been a whole number of years now. Um, the mastery-based learning work group um, and the state board has engaged on this topic, um, spread information about it, did rulemaking about it, um, and we're seeing the variety of subject areas allowed for um, at the district level to, to just broaden, and that's, that's pretty cool. I'm excited that these data are used uh, by the financial education public private partnership um, to answer questions such as how is financial education delivered based on um, on the size of the school district. Smaller school districts are more likely to require financial education than large school districts. Districts are most likely to require financial education for credit embedded in a four credit class or as a standalone class for credit. And the following data behind those conclusions show uh, what the financial education requirements are for districts of differing size groups. Uh, before I forget, uh, we received board member feedback to look into the demographics. Uh, we did conduct analyses um, using Pearson's uh, correlation coefficient uh, and, and found some relationships between race and the availability of, you know, high school and beyond plan or graduation pathways, but uh, it's not school level data. Um, so there's, uh, you know, some caution in interpreting it because uh, what's available at the district level in a district that serves a greater percentage of students of color than average um, may be different at the district level than at the schools that uh, are serving uh, populations that are uh, greater than the state average of uh, students of color, uh, the percentage of them. And, and what Federal Office of Civil Rights data shows is that there are significant gaps in whether uh, students of color are able to attend high schools that offer advanced coursework so um, we held off on doing uh, demographic analyses um, at, at this stage of the re release of this information, um, but we, we were responsive to your interest and it did yield some interesting results, but I think we need to uh, look at those further um, so as to be cautious with uh, what takeaways um, someone may, may place faith in. Uh, looking at district level data on, on access. So uh, back to the financial education. Um, in, in this slide, you can see that, uh, you know, the very large districts uh, state that personal finance is not required. Uh, personal finance and, uh, you know, financial education and, um, and computer education, technological education are both goals of the program of basic education, but they're not uh, required as specific credit graduation requirements within the graduation framework. Um, 
leading to some very different results and how those are implemented. And the idea is that the student attains those uh, literacy and, and financial education computers by the time they graduate, but it doesn't really specify how that's done. Um, so this work for the public-private partnership um, and their executive director, Tracy Godat, is, is very useful information and helps the state uh, provide a much needed um, skill set for students. As far as subject area credit graduation requirements, the, the state minimums for graduation, all districts that serve high schools certified that they offered four credits of English, at least three credits of social studies, including civics, at least three credits of math. Uh, this number includes uh, five school districts that uh, require, they're all small, and they require at least four or four credits of math. Um, those are Inchellium, Northport, Trout Lake, Valley, and Warden school districts. All districts um, meet at least three credits of science um, with quick attack school district requiring four. A uh, major compliance push of this uh, round of basic education compliance was uh, the lab science requirement. Uh, districts weren't um, properly responding when the state requirement is at least two credits of uh, lab science with a uh, broad definition adopted by the board um, of natural inquiry into the natural world. You, you know, you know, um, that, that may not necessarily require, well, does not require uh, specialized laboratory facilities. And uh, 23 of the district responses were that they required at least three credits of lab science. So major progress made on that this year um, to further the implementation of 24 credit requirements. So um, school districts are required to have at least two credits uh, that consist of uh, 1.5 credits of fitness and 0.5 of health. Um, districts implemented this, but there were misconceptions about, you know, if it's a one and one split, a, a, a two credit split with it embedded. And um, it's something to examine for next, next year. And of the districts reporting at least, uh, you know, the one credit of art, uh, fine arts, um, 21 uh, of the districts uh, require at least two credits of art for all students. And Valley School District requires four credits of both art and of fitness. Um, so receiving it the whole high school experience. And the most interesting finding is around the one credit of career and technical education or occupational education as a lab. And districts that are offering more than the state minimum for CTE have been increasing year on year. Um, I think this is because uh, districts want to make the personalized pathway requirement um, straightforward for students to fulfill and uh, perhaps simplify um, how that's conveyed to students. So what you're seeing here is, uh, is you know, a considerable number of districts uh, offering somewhere above that uh, one credit of CTE, which gets students well on their way to um, uh, both meeting the personalized pathway requirements within the graduation framework, which are flexible, but should be tied to the high school and beyond plan goal, or, um, in order to meet the CT course sequence as is allowed for in the graduation pathway options. Here's a chart for your, uh, to answer questions that you might have about the district size groupings that were used. 
uh, they were based on nine size cuts that are typically used by OSPI school financial and apportionment services um, within the staff. Uh, you know, Andrew, Randy, and I all, uh, and Linda all discussed, uh, you know, whether um, we should use uh, quintiles or the size cuts. Well, we ended up, uh, you know, not wanting to overwhelm you with nine different sets of data. We, we turned those into... Uh, um, cuts between um, the different size groupings that are used by school apportionment at OSPI. Uh, so on the left, you see the original groupings. On the right, you see um, the groupings used in the analysis. Uh, on the chart on the right, they should be 999s, a little detail, but. Uh, uh, we're going to produce an analytical document uh, to accompany this uh, um, in the near future. Um, there are lots more interesting findings. Um, and, you know, thank you for staying tuned. And um, it's an honor to uh, work on this compliance process because I, I think it really does ensure that uh, that that students, um, well, that districts are aware of minimum state graduation requirements are making thoughtful decisions within the, within the, the, the mission to, to, to offer a program of basic education to all students in the state, thereby uh, um, preparing them uh, with adequate instructional time um, throughout the school years to meet career and college uh, ready graduation requirements. Um, during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, education uh, and life in general has not been uh, how we would like it to be. Uh, rulemaking on instructional hours by the state board was intended to um, allow the district continue to continue offering the program of basic education during a, uh, a crisis and to, um, you know, although uh, for, for most students, uh, instruction is, is most effective in person. Um, but during this situation, uh, public health measures required otherwise. So uh, we acted proactively on that. And, um, you know, the, the uh, reopening plan information uh, indicates that, uh, that, that I summarized earlier indicates that that was um, a very useful policy effect um, and was made so by the board's authorities that I've uh, summarized here. Um, thank you so much and have a good day.